Hi everybody. Uh, right now in western Pennsylvania, it's the middle of July. Uh, the dog days have really started to set in and uh, I want to share a couple terrestrial patterns with you. Uh, this is one uh, that's really been working for a number of years. Uh, it's called the spider pattern. It may have a more official name, but um, we've called it the spider here for, uh, for many years. I learned how to tie this fly approximately 15 years ago from um, one of my buddies, Jerry. We were fishing a river together and he just absolutely was out fishing me like six trout to one using this pattern. Um, I eventually put it on, just began uh, catching trout after trout after trout, earning me the nickname Spider-Man for a couple of years. In fact, some of my um, early fly rods that my Uncle John built for me still have the nickname Spider-Man Tim on them. Uh, so it's a fly that I love uh, coming back to every now and then. I use this fly primarily for brook trout and for panfish. It's a really great bluegill fly. They just love to, to hit it and it's a lot of fun and it's really an exciting fly to use. So I'm going to go over the instructions here in a, in a bit. I'm going to also show you an example of the fly before I start tying. I'll list the materials for you and then I'll tie the fly. I hope you enjoy. This is the uh, spider pattern we're going to be tying today. If you take a look at it, you'll notice that we have a, a body consisting of foam rubber. We have legs. We have eight legs that we're going to be using some bass bug skirting uh, to tie those with. And that's it. The body is just a thread body. So here's a quick look at the fly before we start tying one. And uh, I'm going to list all the materials for you as well. All right, let's get started uh, tying this this spider pattern. I'm going to be using these saber hooks today. Um, they're a, a 2x long hook. It's a, called a hopper and terrestrial hook. Uh, I don't know if it's a, that important that you use a hopper and terrestrial hook, but I do like this 2x long hook. Um, so I, I kind of, I'm going to stick with these ones regardless of whether or not they're actually called a hopper and terrestrial hook. Um, to start off this fly, I'll take my hook. I'm going to open my vise just a hair, pinch the barb down. I prefer fishing barbless hooks. I like to pinch the barb down when I first um, tie the fly before I even start tying it because if, if that tempering is bad in the hook, um, I want to know immediately. I don't want to have the fly finished and then have the tempering go bad. For this fly, I'm going to coat the entire um, body before with thread uh, before tying it. Normally you'll just put your thread in a certain place along um, the fly, but in this case I want to coat the entire um, I want to co in, coat the entire hook with thread. Um, so it doesn't prevent, so it prevents this fly from slipping once you have it tied completely. I'm using a 6 aught uh, chartreuse colored thread. Let's see if I can get this stuff kind of out of the way for you. I'm going to go back just above where that barb should be, uh, somewhere in that area. Come forward just a hair, just to create a little bit of a space. So the main uh, body of this is a foam. I just have a giant foam pad to show you, not really anything interesting going on here. I'll try to zoom out. You can see that uh, I've cut this a couple times uh, already. I've used the corner of it for some other patterns, including these uh, including these flies. But for this spider pattern, I just cut out a few pieces of foam in various sizes. This is the size I'm going to use today. Um, the, the width, the length, really depends on what you're um, going to do to tie the fly and what size you're going for. This is definitely too big for this fly. I'm going to leave it that way just to kind of illustrate a few things for you. I'll be tying it on, I'll be placing it on top of the hook, lashing it on two spots, and I'll be uh, adding legs to this fly as well. Then I'm going to trim this piece of foam afterwards. To lash it on, it's pretty simple. I'm just going to make sure it extends a little bit over the back, a little bit over the front of the hook. I'm going to pinch it between my fingers, and I'm just going to lash it in there with very, very strong uh, turns of this thread. I want to ensure that it's lashed in there. I really don't care how it looks while it's in there. Um, I typically fish for brook trout, um, pan fish with this type of a fly. So once it's lashed in there, um, I know I'm good. I want to be able to pull a little bit of my thread and not have it move. You can see it moved a little bit, so I'm going to put a couple threads in front of it, a couple wraps behind it, put a few more lashing wraps in, pull down. Now it's, it's holding firm. For the legs, I'm going to be using, um, I believe it's just skirting for some bass bugs, some bass lures for bass fishermen. This is relatively inexpensive stuff to buy. I have a chartreuse color skirting. It's flexible. This entire package may have cost 99 cents or two dollars somewhere in there and you can see it's going to have a ton of legs that are going to be able to um, that I'll be able to use for quite a long time. To use this stuff what I do I'm going to cut each one. And I'll just do this one at a time so you get an idea of what's going on. And I'm going to place this this skirting behind my thread. Hold the tips of it 
pull it down to one side, release it so it flares out a little bit. Let me get another one cut for you. Same thing, put it behind the thread, hold the tips together, put it on this side, put a couple locking wraps in, and now I have one set of legs. So I'm going to now wrap forward, get a little closer to the eye of the hook. I'm going to bring my, um, I'm going to bring the foam together again. I want to try to get a little closer to the eye if possible. And now I'm going to lash this in again. And you have to watch out because these legs from that previous lashing really want to jump forward. It looks like it's okay. It's not quite holding in there yet, so I'm going to put a couple wraps in front. Go back, lashing in with a couple firm tugs. Now it's in there. Do the same thing. I'm going to put two more legs in. There's two. And let me put one more set. Now when you're tying these flies and you really, um, you're tying a lot of these, you want to have all this stuff pre-cut ahead of time. In this case, this is only going to take me a few minutes, so it's really not that, that big of a deal. When I'm trying to tie a dozen of these at a time, then I'll, I'll really you know, place an emphasis on having all the materials ready. Okay, so I have all that lashed together. If you look at this fly from the, a top view, so you get an idea of what it's kind of looking right, like right now. It's, no, it's not finished yet, but you can get a gist of it from the bottom. You can see how this is pinched together. There's a little gap in there, and that's not a bad thing. You can kind of fish this as a popper if you like at times, or of a gurgler, I guess, and having that little gap in there really seems to make a, a big difference, a positive difference. Let me finish the fly, and then we're going to do a little bit of trimming. I'm going to pull all this stuff forward, put a couple locking wraps, single half hitch, get a little more thread. Now I'm going to finish everything off. One, two, three should suffice. I may eventually put a little bit of head cement on the front of this because this is a fly that, that takes a lot of beating with panfish, brook trout. Um, I'm not afraid to cast this into some spots um, that I would otherwise probably not cast other flies since this is such an easy one to tie. So I'm really not afraid to lose this fly. So um, I really want to make sure everything's secure on it. Now it's time to trim it. Now it's really up to you how you trim this fly. I'm going to show you the way that I prefer to trim it. There's no right or wrong way to trim this whatsoever. Let me back the camera out just a little bit more so you, you get an idea of what's going on for this trimming. I like to trim it to points at the front and at the back. If you want to leave the front as it is right now, you'll be able to, to uh, pull this across water and it will create a gurgling sound which in many cases attracts lots of fish. That's a, a decent technique for a smallmouth, for some panfish. Um, but in my case, I'm going to be using this in splatting and on the water. So I'm just going to make a couple trims in here. Have it just come to a little point. It's a little bit too big of a head still for my liking. So now I have just a little point at the head. And I want to do the same thing at the rear. Now it's kind of taken on the look of an, an ant if you, if you want. If you would cut those off, you can have it uh, looking a little bit more like a beetle in that terrestrial look. I'm going to trim the legs because they're definitely too long. Again, that's too long for my liking. But this is a little more reasonable. Uh, I could probably even do a little bit more trimming here if I absolutely have to. But that's not the most critical thing. Um, what's nice about this pattern, if you get to the, the water and you want to do a little more trimming, I suggest leaving them long and then doing the trimming on the water. But that is the completed uh, spider. This has been a great pattern for me over the years. I'll give you another look at the bottom. A look at the top. And I will coat this with a little head cement. I'll just place a little head cement um, just underneath, right behind the eye of the hook. Uh, aside from that, it's a very simple pattern to tie. A uh, very easy pattern to fish. I really do like to splash it down to spots. And uh, typically when fish strike, they really react aggressively towards this. Well, I hope you enjoyed um, learning a little bit about this spider pattern. Uh, good luck using it on the streams and in the lakes. Thanks again for watching.